Well, Shalom. So I just wanted to point out some of the many depths of the scriptures of the Bible. There's so many things within things. There's a lot of lessons here. I'm not going to cover all the lessons. You can actually take away however it applies to you. I'll just cover and focus on a couple of them. Uh, two of the things I want to do is righteousness versus self-righteousness. Also, I think a bigger importance is man's first oral law and man's inclination to theology. And we're going to find man's first oral law. So, <clears throat> let's look at holiness and righteousness. In this traditional understanding, the idea is correct performance, it's regulations, and legal perfection. But the Hebrew word for holy is Kadesh, which comes from the root word Kadash. And it simply just means to be set apart or set apart for a specific purpose. So this Hebrew root is Zadok, and it's Zedek and Zedek and Zedaka. The use of righteous as translates for Yashar, which is just, justice, justify, which all occur as equivalents in the Hebrew. So in the book of Habakkuk, the righteous has its meaning as it stands for Israel, as represented by the pious, the meek, the poor, and the remnant. In Amos, righteousness and justice are used as higher and nobler and more pleasing in the sight of God than ritual righteousness. In Psalms, the righteous represents again the meek and the lowly, that is faithful, who in spite of persecution cling to God's law. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for the righteousness, for they shall be filled. Righteousness, we learn in Ephesians, is part of the breastplate. Uh, the breastplate of righteousness protects our heart and basically keeps us from thinking we've earned our way in. Uh, the Jewish version of the Bible is translates as kindness, abundance, belovedness, and gracious acts. So, Yeshua Jesus uses it in this way when he says not to do your acts of righteousness in front of the others. And then he goes on to speak about giving to the poor in Matthew 6. This lesson was first introduced in the subtext of Genesis 2 in the beginning, and yet we seem maybe to have missed it or overlook it. This is where Adam adds the first oral law. In Genesis 2 and 3. In Genesis, we know the Lord God had planted the garden in the east and in Eden. And there he put in uh, man he had formed. The Lord God made all things. And the trees grow out of the ground. And trees that were pleasing to the eye, which was good for the food. In the middle of the garden, there was a tree of life and a tree of knowledge and a good and evil. So the Lord commanded man, you were free to eat from any tree in the garden. We all know the story. But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So in Genesis 3, we read that when Satan tempts Eve, he says, Woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Eve replies to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Eve responded by stating you must not touch it or you will die. But if we're reading Genesis as the way it plays out as in shot and not as in a, a midrash or allegorical, This would insinuate somewhere Adam added the commandment. Maybe as a safe measure. It seems Adam and Eve were so stringent at safeguarding that they added extra laws or activities in order to ensure their ability not to fail. It would seem by pushing the limit and breaking through a man-made stipulation of their rigorous rules, they would find out that the first act of touching was now doubtful. She didn't get struck by lightning. Nothing happened. So this would push an ever-growing tendency to now tempt to the other part of the rule. So anyways, um, throughout many churches, throughout many theologies, 
we, we've implied a lot of things that aren't there. We've implied a lot of rules to keep us from doing things that aren't there. So, so all of this is kind of theology at play. And we also have the lesson of righteousness. If you think you're too good and you think you can do things on your own, we see here that by putting something of your own there, it was guaranteed to bring failure. We also see a, we also see probably the dangers and too much focus on our own understanding of God's word or scripture. Like I said, there's many, many lessons you can take away from here. I just thought it was neat to look at one layer of one scripture and find other layers in it. So, shalom.